The room in the castle. Is it some lurking remnant of the Elder World in each of us that draws us towards the beings which survive from other eons? Surely there must be such a remnant in me, for there can be no sane or wholesome reason why I should have strayed that day to the old legend-infested ruin on the hill. Nor can any commonplace reason be deduced for my finding the secret underground room there, and still less for my opening the door of horror which I discovered. It was on a visit to the British Museum that I first heard of the legend which suggested a reason for the general avoidance of a hill outside Brychester. I had come to the museum in search of certain volumes preserved there, not books of demonic lore, but extremely scarce tomes dealing with the local history of the Severn Valley, as visualized in retrospect by an 18th century clergyman. A friend who lived in the Camside region near Barclay had asked me to look up some historical facts for his forthcoming article in the Camside Observer, which I could impart to him when I began my stay with him that weekend, since he was ill and would not be capable of a London visit for some time. I reached the museum library with no thoughts other than that I would quickly check through the requisite volumes, note down the appropriate quotations, and leave in my car for my destination straight from the museum. Upon entering the lofty ceilinged room of carefully tended books, I found from the librarian that the volumes I wished to study were at that moment in use, but should soon be returned if I cared to wait a short time. To spend this time I was not interested in referring to any historical book, but instead asked the keeper of the volumes to allow me to glance through the museum's copy of the most unobtainable Necronomicon. More than an hour passed in reading it, as best I could. Such suggestions concerning what may lie behind the tranquil façade of normalcy are not easily dismissed from the mind, and I confess that as I read of the alien beings which, according to the author, lurk in dark and shunned places of the world, I found myself accepting what I read as reality. As I pressed deeper into the dark mythos which surrounds those terrors from beyond, bloated Cthulhu, indescribable Shabnigarath, vast Batrachian Dagon, I might have been sucked into the whirlpool of absolute belief had my engrossment not been interrupted by the librarian bearing an armful of yellowed volumes. I surrendered the copy of the Necronomicon to him, and so great was the lurking terror that had been aroused in me that I watched to be certain that the Book of Horror had been locked securely away. Then I turned to the historical volumes I had requested, and began to take notes from the passages in which my friend had expressed interest. As was inevitable, I could not help reading a large proportion of useless matter in my quest for connected material. And it was in a section I had considered useless that my eye noted in passing a reference which was in some way reminiscent of the book I had been reading. At first I thought that my concentration on alien cult practices had metamorphosed a harmless and quaint country legend into something abnormal and disturbing. But on reading further, I realized that this was indeed a rather unconventional legend. Yet be it not thought, the Barclay clergyman had written, that Satan does not send trouble betimes to put fear in those who live by God. I have heard that Mr. Norton was sorely troubled by cries and horrid roars from the woods when he lived nearby, and that one night the drums were so loud that he could not return to his farming for a month from then. But not to burden my reader, I will recount the tale of what a farmer told me not two years ago. One night when I was walking the road outside Barclay, Farmer Cooper came upon me out of the field upon the left side, much begrimed and filled with fear at what he had seen. He spoke at first as if his mind was unsettled, as does poor Tom Cooper when he is overcome by his sickness. But I took him into the church, and the presence of God healed his mind. He asked if I were willing to hear of the blasphemous vision which had come upon him for he thought that indeed the devil must have sent a demon to turn him from good Christian ways. He swore that he had chased a fox which had troubled his livestock, hoping that he could end its nuisance, but it had led him such a dance around the properties of farmers King and Cook that he had lost it, and coming near the river he turned homewards. Upon coming to the crossing over Cambrook Stream, which he used to take homewards, he was dismayed to find it smashed in the middle. While he was making for the ford near Corn Lane, he saw upon a hill a figure of no little strangeness. It seemed to glow with a light that did not stay one color, but did indeed act like a veritable kaleidoscope, which the children use in their play. 
Farmer Cooper did not like it, but he drew near to the hill and climbed until he was nigh unto the horrid object. It was of a clear mineral, the like of which Farmer Cooper has not seen. When I prayed him to tell me of its appearance, he stared at me strangely, and said that so evil a monster was not to be talked of by Christian men. When I pressed him that I must be armed against such demons by full knowledge, he said that it had but one eye like the cyclops, and had claws like unto a crab. He said also that it had a nose like the elephant's, that tis said can be seen in Africa, and great serpent-like growths which hung from its face like a beard, in the fashion of some sea monster. He calls upon the Redeemer to witness that Satan must have taken his soul then, for he could not stop touching the claw of the pestilential image, though he said angelic voices bade him draw back. Then a huge shadow crossed the moon, and though he determined not to look above, he saw the horrid shape cast upon the ground. I do not think he blasphemed in saying that heaven would not protect me if I heard the relation of the shape of that shadow, for he says that he felt as if God had forgotten his welfare when he saw it. That was when he fled the hill, swimming through the Cambrook stream to escape, and he says that something pursued him part of the way, for he heard the clatter of great claws on the ground behind. But he repeated the prayers, as he is wont to do when he hears of some evil, and the scuttling soon faded away. So he had come upon me as I walked on the Barclay Road. I told him to go home and comfort his wife, and to pray the good Lord would help him against evils, which the devil might plan against him, to turn him from the proper way. That night I prayed that these terrible dealings of Satan might soon quit my parish, and that the pit might not take the wretched farmer Cooper. Reaching the bottom of this page, I immediately continued on the opposite leaf, but I quickly realized that something was amiss, for the next paragraph treated of something entirely different. Noting the page numbers, I discovered that the page between the two was missing, so that any further references to the alien figure on the hill were unobtainable so far as I was concerned. Since nothing could now be done to rectify this, and after all, I had come to the museum originally to look up quite different information, I could only return to my original research. However, a few pages on, I noticed an irregularity in the edges of the pages, and on turning to that point, I discovered the missing leaf. With a strange feeling of jubilation, I fitted it back into place and continued my interrupted reading. But this is not the end of the tale of Farmer Cooper. Two months from then, Farmer Norton came to me sorely troubled, saying that the drums in the woods beat louder than ever before. I could not console him further than by saying that he must keep his doors closed and watch for signs of the works of Satan. Then came the wife of Cooper, saying that her husband had on a sudden been took ill, for he leaped up with a shriek most horrid to hear, and ran away towards the woods. I did not like to send men into the woods when the drums beat so fierce, but I called a party of the farmers to go through the woods, watching for signs of the devil, and seek Farmer Cooper. This they did, but soon came back and aroused me, telling a very curious and horrid tale of why they could not bring poor Cooper back and why he was assuredly took by the devil. Where the woods grew thickest, they began to hear drums beating among the trees, and approached the sound fearfully, for they knew what the drums had heralded before now. When they came upon the source, they found Farmer Cooper sitting before a huge black drum, staring as if mesmerized, and beating upon it in a most savage way, as tis said the natives do in Africa. One of the party, Farmer King, made to speak to Cooper, but looked behind him and showed to the others what he saw. They swore that behind Cooper was a great monster, more horrid even than the toad of Barclay is related to be, and most blasphemous in its shape. It must have been the monster which serves to model the figure on the hill, for they say it was somewhat like a spider, somewhat like a crab, and somewhat like a horror in dreams. Now seeing the demon among the trees, Farmer King fled, and the others followed him. They had not gone far when they heard a shriek of great agony in the voice of Farmer Cooper, and another sound which was like the roaring of some great beast, while the beating of the black drum was ceased. A few minutes after then, they heard a sound of wings, like the flapping of a great bat, which died away in the distance. They managed to get to Campside Lane, and soon returned to the village to tell of the fate of the wretched Cooper.
Though this was two years ago, I do not doubt that the demon still lives and must roam the woods in wait for the unwary. Perhaps it still comes into the village, for all those who went seeking Farmer Cooper have dreamed of the monster ever after, and one died not long ago, swearing that something peered at the window and drew his soul from him. What it is, I do not know. I think it is a demon sent from hell by Satan. But Mr. Daniel Jenner, who reads many books of the history of the region, says it must be what the Romans found behind a stone door in a camp, which was here long before the invasion. At any rate, prayers against Satan seem to have little effect on it. So, but it must be something far different from the monsters, which are wont to trouble good Christian communities. Perhaps it will die if my flock keep away from the woods. But I hear strange rumours that Sir Gilbert Morley, who came to live near Seven Ford some years ago, counts himself able to subdue the devil by black arts, and is said to hope that his blasphemous dealings may give him control of the monster of the woods. This ended the references to the legendary haunter of the woods, but to me it did not seem likely that this was the only probable legend concerning it. The mention at the last of the attempts of some eighteenth-century warlock to subdue the being sounded like an indication of some tale of the actual outcome of Molly's experiments, and I could easily spare an hour to search for references to the further myth. Not, of course, that my reading of the Necromicon had made me credulous about fictitious monsters, but it would be a topic of conversation for when I visited my campsite friend, and perhaps I could even visit the home of Sir Gilbert Morley, if anything remained of the building, and if, indeed, such a person had ever existed. Determined to make a search for the legend which I felt sure would be recounted somewhere, I had the librarian select all volumes which might be of interest to me in my quest. The final selection included Wilshire's The Vale of Barclay, Hill's Legendary and Customs of the Seven Valley, and Sangster's Notes on Witchcraft in Monmouthshire, Gloucestershire, and the Barclay region. My original research forgotten, I began to peruse the books, not without a shudder at certain passages and illustrations. The Wilshire volume I soon dispensed with. Apart from the usual stories about female apparitions and earthbound monks, the only legends which touched on the supernatural were those of the Witch of Barclay and the Barclay Toad. This last, though a hideous one, dealing with an inhuman monstrosity, which was kept in a dungeon and which fed on human corpses, did not appear to help me in my search. The Hill and Sangster volumes were more productive, however. Various passages, some occupying over one complete page, told of strange things glimpsed by unwary travellers in the Severn region. Still, I could not think what everything reputed to exist in the surrounding countryside could bear on my present quest. Then I chanced upon a passage in Sangster's work, which could be nothing but a reference to the case with which I was concerned. It began by describing almost exactly the occurrences of which I had already read, and continued in the following manner. What this being actually was, whence it originally came, and why no legends concerning it are heard before this point, are questions which the reader will ask. There are vague answers for all. The being was supposedly Beatis, a pre-human being which was worshipped as a deity. It was released, according to the legend, by Roman soldiers, from behind a stone door in a camp of indeterminate origin, built long before the advent of the Romans in Britain. As to why there are no legends antedating that of Farmer Cooper's discovery, it is said that there were indeed legends, but in a form so unrecognisable that they were not connected with the later tales. Apparently the terrifying Barclay Toad was the same being as the deity Beatis. Indeed, though the being has only one eye, it does, when its proboscis is retracted occasionally, resemble the general shape of the toad. How it was imprisoned in the Barclay dungeon, and how it eventually escaped, is not told in the legend. It had some hypnotic power, so that it may have hypnotized someone to open the cell door, though it is likely that this power was used only to render its victims helpless. After its encounter with the farmer, it had finally been called from its place in the woods by one Sir Gilbert Morley, who owned a Norman castle, long uninhabited, outside Sevenford. The said Morley had been shunned for quite a time by all those living nearby. There was no specific reason why, but he was reputed to have made a pact with Satan, and people did not like the way bats seemed to cluster at the window of one particular tower room. 
nor the strange shapes which formed in the mist which often settled into the valley. At any rate, Molly had stirred the horror in the woods out of its festering sleep, and imprisoned it in a cellar room in his great mansion off the Barclay Road, no trace of which remains nowadays. As long as it was under his power, he could tap its inherent cosmic vitality and communicate with the sendings of Cthulhu, Glaki, Daoloth, and shub -Niggurath. He was supposed to lure travellers to his homestead, where he would manage to bring them near the cellar and lock them inside. When no victims were forthcoming, he would send the thing out to feed. Once or twice, late homecomers would be struck speechless with terror by the spectacle of Morley in flight, with a frightful winged thing flying ahead of him. Before long he was forced to remove it and imprison it in a hidden underground room at the castle. Forced to do this, because according to the legend, it had grown too vast for the cellar room, growing out of all proportion to the food it ate. Here it remained in the daytime, while after dark he would open the secret door and let it free to feast. It returned before dawn, and he would also return and re-imprison it. If the door were closed, the creature would not be free to roam, by virtue of some seal on the door. One day, after Morley had closed the door on the horror inside, his closing the door was apparent, since searchers found no trace of an open door, he disappeared and did not return. The castle, now unattended, is slowly decaying, but the secret portal has apparently remained intact. According to the legend, Beatis yet lurks in the hidden room, ready to wake and be released if someone should open the hidden lock. This I read in the Sangster volume. Before proceeding any further, I had the librarian search for data on the being Beatis in the various books in the locked bookcase. Finally, he brought forth the following, which he discovered in Prinz de Vermis Mysteries. Beatis, the serpent-bearded, the god of forgetfulness, came with the great old ones from the stars, called by obeisances made to his image, which was brought by the deep ones to earth. He may be called by the touching of his image by a living being. His gaze brings darkness on the mind, and it is told that those who look upon his eye will be forced to walk into his clutches. He feasts upon those who stray to him, and from those upon whom he feasts he draws a part of their vitality, and so grows vaster. So I read in Ludwig Prynne's volume of horrifying blasphemies, and I was not slow in shutting it and returning it to the librarian when I was sure that nothing more on Beatis could be found in the book. This was also the last reference to this terrifying enigma that I could discover in any volume I had selected, and I handed them back to the custodian. I happened to look at the clock at that moment, and saw that I had spent far more time in my researches than intended. Returning to the original volume by the Barclay clergyman, I quickly noted down the points named by my friend, which I had not already copied, and then left the museum. It was about noon, and I intended to drive from the museum straight to Camside, covering as much distance as possible during daylight. Dropping my notebook in the dashboard pocket, I started the engine and moved out into the traffic. Less vehicles were driving in the direction I took than in the opposite direction, but some time passed before I found myself on the outskirts of London. After that, I drove without giving much thought to the landscape flashing past the windscreen, nor did I particularly notice the approach of darkness, until I realized, upon leaving a roadside café where I had drawn up for a meal, that night had fallen. The landscape following my stop at the café became merely a view of two discs of yellow hurrying along the road ahead or sliding across the hedge at each bend. But as I neared Barclay, I began to be haunted by thoughts of the unholy practices which had been carried out in this region in olden times. As I passed through Barclay, I remembered the horrible stories which were told about the town, about the leprous bloated toad monster which had been kept in a dungeon, and about the witch of Barclay, off whose coffin the chains had inexplicably fallen before the corpse stepped forth. Of course, they were merely superstitious fancies, and I was not really troubled by them, even though the books I had read that afternoon had mentioned them with such credibility. But the glimpses which the headlights now gave of the surroundings, of unlit black houses and moistly peeling walls, were not reassuring. When I finally drew into the driveway of my friend's house, he was there to guide me in with a flashlight, my headlamps having given out between Campside and Brychester. He ushered me into the house, remarking that I must have had a difficult journey towards the last, along the lanes without lights. Well, I could only agree with him. 
It was quite late, later than I had intended to arrive, but the unallowed for research at the museum had taken some time. And after a light meal and a conversation over it, I went to my room to sleep off the effects of the somewhat hectic day. The next morning, I took from my car the notebook containing the information I had acquired at the museum, and this reminded me of my intention to visit the ruin of Morley's castle. My friend, though able to move about the house, was not fit to leave it for long periods, and since he would be working on his forthcoming article that afternoon, I would have a chance to seek out the castle. After I had given him the notebook, I mentioned casually that I intended to take a stroll through the nearby countryside after dinner, and asked him whether he could suggest any localities that might interest me. You might drive down to Barclay and take a walk round there, he advised. Plenty of survivals from earlier times there. Only I wouldn't stay too long, because of the mists. We'll probably have one tonight, and they're really bad. I certainly wouldn't want to drive in a mist like we get. I had thought, I said tentatively, of going along to Sevenford to try and find this castle where a warlock's familiar was supposed to have been sealed up. I wonder if you know where it is. It was owned by someone named Morley, Sir Gilbert Morley, who was apparently in league with the devil or something of the sort. He seemed rather shocked, and looked strangely disturbed by my mentioning the place. Listen, Parry, he said, I think I may have heard of this Morley. There's a horrible tale which connects him with the disappearance of newborn babies around here in the 1700s, but I'd rather not say anything more about him. When you've lived down here a bit, and seen them all locking their doors on certain nights, and putting signs in the earth beneath the windows, because the devil's supposed to walk on those nights. And when you've heard things flying over the houses, when everyone's locked in, and there's nothing there, then you won't be interested in tracking down things like that. We've got a home help who believes in such things, and she always makes the signs for our house, so I suppose that's why it always flies over. But I wouldn't go searching out places that have been polluted by witchcraft, even protected as I may be. Good God, Scott, I rebuked, laughing, but rather disturbed by the way he had changed since coming to live in the country. Surely you don't believe that these star signs they make around here can have any effect, for good or for evil? Well, if you're so set on preserving my neck, I'll just have to ask one of the villagers. I don't suppose they'll have such a misplaced protective instinct as you seem to have. Scott remained unconvinced. You know, I used to be as sceptical as you are now, he reminded me. Can't you realize that it must have been something drastic that changed my outlook? For God's sake, believe me. Don't go looking for something to convince you. I repeat, I said annoyed, that my intended pleasant afternoon should provoke an argument. I'll just have to ask one of the villagers. All right, all right, Scott interrupted, irritated. There is a castle on the outskirts of Sevenford, supposed to have belonged to Morley, where he kept some sort of monster. Apparently he left it locked away one day, and never returned to let it out again. Got carried off by an elemental he called up, I believe. It's still waiting, so they say, for some imbecile to come along looking for trouble and let it out again. Not missing the last remark's significance, I asked, How do I get to the castle from Sevenford? Oh, look, Parry, isn't that enough? he said, frowning. You know the legend of the castle's true, so why go any further? I know the story that the castle exists is true, I pointed out, but I don't know if the underground room exists. Still, I suppose the people at Sevenford would know. If you have to go and sell yourself to the devil, Scott finally said, the castle is on the other side of Sevenford from the river, on a rise, a small hill, I suppose you'd call it, not far from Cotton Row. But look, Parry, I don't know why you're going to this place at all. You may not believe in this thing, but the villagers wouldn't go near the castle, and neither would I. That being is supposed to have some unbelievable attributes. If you just glance at its eye, you have to offer yourself to it. Not that I believe all this literally, but I'm sure there's something in the castle that haunts it horribly. It was quite obvious that he sincerely believed all he was saying, which only strengthened my resolve to visit the castle and make a thorough search. After the end of our argument, the conversation became somewhat strained, and before dinner was served, we were both reading books. As soon as I had finished dinner, I collected a flashlight from my room, and after making other preparations for the journey, drove off in the direction of Sevenford. After a short drive along the A38 and the Barclay Road, I found that I would have to pass through Sevenford itself, and double back if the car were to be parked near the castle. 
As I was driving through Sevenford, I noticed over the church porch a stone carving depicting an angel holding a large star-shaped object in front of a cowering toad-like gargoyle. Curious, I braked the car and walked along the moss-covered path between two blackened pillars to speak to the vicar. He was pleased to see a stranger in his church, but became wary when I told him why I had approached him. Could you tell me, I asked, the meaning of that peculiar group of carvings over your porch, the one depicting the toad monster and the angel? He seemed slightly worried by my question. Obviously the triumph of good over evil, he suggested. But why is the angel holding a star? Surely a cross would be more appropriate. The vicar nodded. That disturbs me too, he confessed, because it seems to be a concession to the superstitions round here. They say it was originally not part of the church, but was brought here by one of the early parish priests, who never revealed where he found it. They say that the star is the same one they have to use on All Hallows' Eve, and that the angel isn't an angel at all, but a being from some other world. And as for the toad, they say it represents the so-called Barclay toad, which is still waiting to be released. I tried to take the thing off the porch, but they won't have it. Threaten not to attend church at all if I remove it. Was there ever a priest in my position? I left the church feeling rather unsettled. I did not like the reference to the carvings not being part of the church, for this would surely mean that the legend was more widespread than I had thought. But of course the relief was part of the building, and it was only a distortion of the legend that spoke of its once being separate. I did not look back at the carven scene as the car moved away, nor at the vicar, who had left the building and was staring up at the top of the porch. Turning off Mill Lane, I cruised down Cotton Row. The castle came into view as I turned the corner and left behind me a row of untenanted cottages. It was set on the crest of the hill, three walls still standing, though the roof had long ago collapsed. A lone tower stood like a charred finger against the pale sky, and I momentarily wondered if this were the tower around whose window bats had clustered so long ago. Then the car stopped, and I withdrew the key, slammed the door, and began to climb the slope. The grass was covered with droplets of water, and the horizon was very vague from the oncoming mist. The moistness of the ground made progress uphill difficult, but after a few yards a series of stone stairs led to the castle, which I ascended. The stairs were covered with greenish moss, and in scattered places I seemed to detect faint marks, so indistinct that I could not determine their shape, but only have the feeling that there was something vaguely wrong about them. What could have made them I had no idea, for the absence of life near the castle was extremely noticeable, the only moving object being an occasional bloated bird, which flapped up out of the ruins, startled by my entry into the castle. There was surprisingly little left of the castle. Most of the floor was covered with the debris of the fallen roof, and what could be seen under the fragments of stone gave no indication of the location of any secret room. As a possibility struck me, I climbed the stairway which led into the tower, and examined the surface at the bottom of the circular staircase. But the steps were mere slabs of stone. The thought of the tower suggested another idea. Perhaps the legend lied when it spoke of the monster's prisoners being underground? But the door of the upper tower room swung open easily enough, revealing a narrow empty chamber. My heart gave an unpleasant lurch, when moving further in to survey the entire room, I saw, in place of a bed under the window, a coffin. With some trepidation I moved closer, and peered into the coffin, and I think I must have given a sigh of relief when I saw that the coffin, whose bottom was spread with earth, was empty. It must have been some bizarre kind of burial vault, even though it was certainly unorthodoxly situated. But I could not help remembering that clouds of bats had used to collect at the window of some tower in this castle, and there seemed to be a subconscious connection which I could not quite place. Leaving the tower room rather quickly, I descended the stairs and examined the ground on all sides of the castle. Nothing but rubble met my gaze, though once I did see an odd sign scratched on a slab of rock. Unless the door to the secret room lay under the remains of the collapsed roof, it presumably did not exist at all. And after ten minutes of dragging the fragments of stone to other positions, the only effects of which were to tear my fingernails and cover me with dust, I realized that there was no way of discovering whether the door did, in fact, lie beneath the debris. At any rate, I could return to the house 
and point out to Scott that no malevolent entity had dragged me off to its lair. And so far as I was able, I had proved that there was no evidence of a hidden room at the castle. I started back down the stone stairs which led to the road, looking out across the gently curving green fields, now fast becoming vague through the approaching mist. Suddenly I tripped and fell down one step. I put my hand on the step above me to help me rise, and almost toppled into a yawning pit. I was tottering on the brink of an open trapdoor, the step forming the door, and the stone which I had kicked out of place forming the lock. A stone ladder thrust into the darkness below, leading down to the unseen floor of a room of indeterminate extent. Drawing out my flashlight, I switched it on. The room now revealed was completely bare, except for a small black cube of some metal at the foot of the ladder. Square in shape, the room measured approximately twenty feet by twenty feet, the walls being of a dull grey stone, which was covered with pits out of which grew the fronds of pallid ferns. There was absolutely no evidence of any sort of animal life in the room, nor indeed that an animal of any kind had ever inhabited it, except, perhaps, for a peculiar odour, like a mixture of the scents of reptiles and decay, which rose chokingly for a minute from the newly opened aperture. There appeared to be nothing to interest me in the entire room, barring the small black cube which lay in the centre of the floor. First, ensuring that the ladder would bear my weight, I descended it and reached the cube. Kneeling beside it on the pockmarked grey floor, I examined the piece of black metal. When scratched with a penknife, it revealed a strange violet luster, which suggested that it was merely covered with a black coating. Inscribed hieroglyphics had been incised upon its upper surface, one of which I recognized from the Necronomicon, where it was given as a protection against demons. Rolling it over, I saw that the underside of the cube was carved with one of those star-shaped symbols which were so prevalent in the village. This cube would make an excellent piece of evidence to show that I actually had visited the supposedly haunted castle. I picked it up, finding it surprisingly heavy, above the weight of a piece of lead the same size, and held it in my hand. And in doing so, I released that abomination which sent me leaping up the creaking ladder and racing madly down the hill, onto Cotton Row and into my car. Fumbling at the ignition key, which I had inserted upside down, I looked back to see an obscene reaching member protruding from the gulf against the fast misting sky. Finally, the key slipped into its socket, and I drove away from the nightmare I had seen with a violence that brought a scream from the gears. The landscape flashed by at a nerve-wrenching pace, each shadow in the dim headlights seeming a hurtling demon, until the car swung into the driveway at Scott's house, barely stopping before smashing into the garage doors. The front door opened hurriedly at my violent entry. Scott hastened out of the rectangle of light from the hall lamp. By that time, I was half faint from the hideous sight in the pit and the frantic journey after it, so that he had to support me as I reeled into the hallway. Once in the living room, and fortified with a long drink of brandy, I began to recount the events of that afternoon. Before I had reached the terrors of the castle, he was leaning forward with a disturbed air, and he uttered a groan of horror when I spoke of the coffin in the tower room. When I described the horrible revelation which had burst upon me in the underground room, his eyes dilated with terror. But that's monstrous, he gasped. You mean to say the legend spoke of Beatis growing with every victim, and it must have taken Morley at the last, but that what you say could be possible. I saw it long enough before I realized what it was to take in all the details, I told him. Now I can only wait until tomorrow, when I can get some explosives and destroy the thing. Parry, you don't mean you're going to the castle again, he demanded incredulously. My God, after all you've seen, surely you must have enough evidence without going back to that place for more. You've only heard about all the horrors I saw, I reminded him. I saw them. So, but if I don't wipe them out now, they're going to haunt me with knowledge that one day that toad creature may smash out of its prison. I'm not going back there for pleasure this time, but for a real purpose. We know it can't escape yet, but if it's left, it might manage to lure victims to it again and get back its strength. I don't have to look at its eye for what I'm going to do. I know nobody around here would go near. Even the cottages nearby are empty. But suppose someone else like me hears of the legend and decides to follow it up? This time the door will be open, you know. The next morning I had to drive for some miles before discovering that there was nowhere I could buy explosives. 
I finally bought several tins of petrol and hoped that the inflammable liquid would destroy the alien monster. Calling in at Scott's house for my luggage, I was returning to London after finishing my task at the castle, for I did not want to be connected when the local police made their inquiries. I was accosted by the home help, who pressed upon me a curiously figured star-shaped stone, which, she said, would keep off the power of Beatis while I used the petrol. Thanking her, I took my leave of Scott and went out to the car, which I turned out into the roadway. On looking back, I saw both Scott and the woman watching me anxiously from the living room window. The petrol cans on the back seat jangled together abominably, unnerving me as I tried to think of my best plan of action at the castle. I drove in the opposite direction on this journey, for I did not want to pass through Sevenford. For one thing, I wanted to reach the castle as soon as possible, and end the abnormality which scratched at my mind. And besides, I disliked passing that carving of the toad horror over the church porch again. The journey was shorter, and I soon was lifting the petrol cans onto the grass at the side of the road. Lifting the cans near the gaping pit under the stone slab took a great deal of labour and no little time. Placing my cigarette lighter at the edge of the stairway, I prized the caps off the petrol cans. I had taken them around the pit to the next higher step, and now I dipped a piece of plywood from Scott's garage into the petrol in one tin and placed it on the step above. Then lighting the wood with my cigarette lighter, I hurriedly kicked the tins over the edge of the gulf and dropped the blazing wood in after them. I think I was only just in time, for as I pushed the open cans into the pit, a huge black object rose over the edge, drawing back as the petrol and wood hit it, as a snail retracts its eye organs at a touch of salt. Then came a protracted hissing sound from below, coupled with a terrible bass roaring, which rose in intensity and pitch before changing to a repulsive bubbling. I did not dare to look down into what must be seething in fluid agony at the bottom of the pit, but what rose above the trapdoor was dreadful enough. Thin greenish spirals of gas whirled out of the aperture, and collected in a thick cloud about fifty feet above. Perhaps it was merely the effect of some anaesthetic quality of the gas which augmented my imagination, but the cloud seemed to congeal at one point of its ascent into a great swollen toad-like shape, which flapped away on vast bat wings towards the west. That was my last sight of the castle, and its morbidly distorted surroundings. I did not look back as I descended the stone stairs, nor did I glance away from the road ahead, until I had left the glistening of the Severn far over the horizon. Not until the London traffic was pressing around me did I think of the monster as behind me, and even now I cannot stop thinking of what I saw after I lifted the metal cube from the floor of the castle room. As I had picked up the cube from the floor, a strange stirring had begun beneath my feet. Looking down, I saw that the join of floor and wall on one side of the room was ascending the stone, and I managed to clutch a stone rung just before the floor slid away altogether, revealing itself to be a balanced door into a yet vaster room below. Climbing until I was halfway up the hanging ladder, I peered warily into the complete darkness below. No sound came from the blackness, and as yet there was no movement. Not until I attempted to get a firmer grip on the ladder, and in so doing dropped the metal block with a moist thud on something in that blackness, did anything occur. A slithering sound began below me, mixed with a rubbery suction, and as I watched in paralytic terror, a black object slid from underneath the edge of a wall and began to expand upwards, slapping itself blindly against the sides of the smaller room. It resembled a gigantic snake more than anything else, but it was eyeless and had no other facial features. And I was confused by the connections this colossal abnormality could have with Beatis. Was this the haven of some other entity from another sphere, or had Morley called up other demons from beyond forbidden gates? Then I understood, and gave one shriek of horror-fraught realization as I plunged out of the room of malignancy. I heard the thing dash itself flabbily against its prison walls, but I knew the ghastly reason why it could not escape. I looked back once. The obscene black member was reaching frantically around the edge of the pit, searching for the prey it had sensed in its lair a moment before. And at this, I laughed in lunatic glee, for I knew that the thing would search mindlessly until it found that it could reach nothing. It had grown too vast for the cellar room, Sangster had written. 
but had not mentioned just what growth had taken place with each living sacrifice. Or the snake-like thing that had reached for me, that thing as wide as a human body and impossibly long, had been merely the face tentacle of the abomination Beatus.